At the 75th Academy Awards, security is at an all-time high. The press aren't allowed to interview the stars on the red carpet. Not far from the theater, anti-war protesters voiced their message. In Baghdad, many civilians have been killed and wounded in the first days of the war. goes to <laughs> bowling for Columbine. Michael Barrett, Michael Donovan. We like nonfiction and we live in fictitious times. We live in the time where we have fictitious election results that elects a fictitious president. We we live in a time where we have a man sending us to war for fictitious reasons, whether it's the fictitious of duct tape or the fictitious of orange alerts. We are against this war, Mr. Bush. Shame on you, Mr. Bush. Why did you do what you did? I'm an American. <laughs> That's it? Oh, that's a lot. I mean, you stirred the place up like I've never heard it stirred up before. I'm an American, and you don't leave your citizenship when you enter the doors of the Kodak Theater. Tonight, I put America in a good light. I showed how, how vital it is to have free speech in our country, and that all Americans have a right to stand up for what they believe in. There were some boos after the cheers. Your reaction when you heard those boos? Those are all my friends and relatives. <laughs> when I heard that Oscar speech, I was inspired by the honesty, and I wanted to take a deeper look at Michael Moore. It was understood that he would do something, but I wasn't sure what it was. I decided not to, to for it to be a genuine surprise. Michael Moore is going to do what Michael Moore wants to do. I did send him an email where I said, Michael, I believe I know what you're thinking about doing. Don't do it. While I was walking up the aisle, I invited all my fellow nominees to come up on the stage with me because I'm going to speak out against this war and against Bush. Two years later, Michael tells the story a different way. And then they announced our name, and I had nothing to say. I had prepared nothing. Suddenly I've got these two voices uh, in my head, and it was like Gollum from Lord of the Rings, you know? It was like that one, one voice was going, just go up on the stage, blow them a kiss, and walk off the stage. And the other voice is going, no, no, you have to say something, say something. No, you don't have to say anything. Just thank your wardrobe people and your hairstylist and your agent and your lawyer and walk off the stage. Shut the fuck up. I'm driving to Flint to get a feel for the place Michael Moore became synonymous with. It's about 50 minutes north of Detroit and I'm looking forward to learning more about the man whose politics and films I admire. 251-1570 is our telephone number. How do you feel about Michael Moore? He is without question, after Henry Ford, the most well-known person in the history of Michigan. I think it's Henry Ford, Michael Moore, maybe Madonna. I want to hear from you. Do you like him or hate him? Let her rip.
He's a very, very, very manipulative guy, but it's extremely transparent. And also, I didn't like him. I didn't like him from the minute he walked in the room to the minute he waddled on out. What he is is an intellectual and a genius. The cap and everything is show. He's a genius. How do you feel about Michael? Debbie and Grand Blank High. I didn't like his bashing of the area. So you think then Michael, overall, hurt the city of Flint and the surrounding community? Oh, certainly. So do a lot of people. And I think that's why they don't want him back here. He's far less of a documentarian than he is a polemicist, which is actually maybe a little too kind. He's really kind of a holy roller of, uh, of journalism. You know, you can believe him like you believe your preacher, but it isn't exactly as if what you're getting is information that is reliable or trustable. How can you ignore a guy from our community who has won an Academy Award and done all of these things, had best-selling books, television shows, and, uh, you know, b being honored by the Cannes Film Festival, and, I mean, just... It's just incredible. So let's talk about it. 251-1570. What do you think? He's a very complex guy, but he's one of the most caring and giving people that I know. Yet, he can be a bit, uh, how do you say it, megalomaniacal almost at times, <laughs> uh, with a paranoid tinge. I don't think there's been any more influential documentary made um, to the new wave of independent filmmakers than Roger and me because of all the stylistic trademarks and the entertainment value of that film have left a huge mark on the entire field since then. Our hometown of Flint, Michigan was the birthplace of General Motors, the largest corporation in the world. He makes no apology for making politically themed films. Quote, when in this great democracy did political become a dirty word? Well, I think that's a very good question. People who try to fight fair in American politics are a dime a dozen. And they don't bring, you know, millions into the theaters. Michael Moore has been able to make himself heard and has been able to land some actual punches uh, on the backlash right. There's Mike Moore, the guy I've always known, Mike, as I've always called him, and then there's Michael. I see this character on television and I see him in movies, of course, but then there's Mike that I go golfing with and uh, really a lot of things haven't changed outside of the fact that he always picks up the tab now. He's not Saint Mike of the of the working man. He's, you know, showman Mike who 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 makes money and, and does good along the way, but he's still showman Mike. Michael arrives in Toronto for a quick pit stop on his promotional tour of Fahrenheit 9-11. I thought this would be a good chance to tell him about our film and ask him for an interview. I know. City TV has also so asked us to, to do a, a yes. documentary Sorry. on you, and I'm just oh, wondering, oh. is it possible to somehow do a, a longer interview at some point? And yes, at some point, but right now, you know, know. my mission is to, till November 2nd to right. remove. Because you know how popular you are in Canada. I know, and I'm so grateful for it. That's why I came up here for this day, so. Should we, I don't know, con how, how would we contact, I mean, we tried to. These guys know, the Alliance people know. Okay. They know how to reach me. All right. All right. All right. Michael Moore was brought up in Davison, Michigan, a middle-class suburb about 10 miles east of Flint. When you get off the main drag, Davison has a small town feel, almost a throwback to the 1950s, with a population of around 18,000. What kind of city is Davison? A rich place. Unlike where I came from. Well, yeah. It's a fun small town. But he comes from Davison. That's great. Yeah, I thought he was from Flint. I didn't know he's from Davison. Do you know um, who Michael Moore is? Who? Michael Moore? No. Well, then you can't answer. Who's Michael Moore? Tell me. Documentary filmmaker. Oh, I know him. We go way back. Yeah, he's, oh he's pretty cool. Is this going to be on the news? Who Hi. Are properties now? Wow. Oh, my God. So hot. No. <laughs> Well, he's all right, guys. The only thing I didn't agree with was um, bowling for Columbine when he was against the NRA. They do a lot for gun rights. You know, if it wasn't for them, we wouldn't have no gun rights in this country. You know, we'd be like Russia or Canada, you know, where they ain't got no guns. Do you know who Michael Moore is? Oh, yes. Do you? Well, of course. Can I ask you I what? mean, his mother and father are very good friends of mine. So what do you think of the fact that Michael Moore came from Davison? I'm very proud of him. 
Yes, I am. He goes to our church in St. John's, Davidson. A couple of years ago, Michael Moore's name stirred up trouble at his old high school. Ryan Ishu's a fan of Moore's, and he wanted to nominate him for the school's Hall of Fame. One of the board members in the Hall of Fame actually told me, don't waste my time. We'll never let Mike in. And that just rubbed me the wrong way. So at that point, I just decided to start a grassroots effort of Moore supporters here in Davison to start a campaign to, to get Michael Moore into the Hall of Fame. And then there was the other guy who was trying to get me into the Davison High School Hall of Fame. The, the committee got so upset in Davison uh, that they decided to shut the Hall of Fame down entirely. <laughs> they just closed it rather than put me, <laughs> put me in it. And the original bylaws of the Hall of Fame talked about you had to graduate from Davison High School in order to be inducted in the Hall of Fame. For instance, Dr. Howard Peckins here who actually built sets and held cast parties for high school theater department students. And he was also very, very well known for giving free physicals to student athletes. But he never graduated from Davison High School. But building sets and giving physicals to students is considered good enough? That's a small town. Please welcome Michael Moore. We follow Michael on his Slacker Uprising tour across America. He's speaking at 60 universities in 20 states in an effort to get out the youth vote in the 2004 election. Michael is determined to get George Bush out of office and end the war in Iraq. The United States hasn't been this divided since the Vietnam War. There's an intense debate about the whole future of the American social consensus. There's a lot at stake. People get very polarized and very passionate. By trailing Michael, we hope we can convince him to do an interview with us. Our emails and letters have gone unanswered. Michael Moore spends a lot of his time and a lot of his energy endorsing Democrats who, in actuality, don't really vote in favor of the issues that he brings up in his films. That's not it. Huh? No, we didn't shout us down. We didn't interfere with your little gig. I'm not interfering with your gig. Isn't this a free country? So I can't talk to them? Not on this side. Let's go on the other side. What? The Bush? Yeah. The Bush is in the way. That's right. That's the problem, I guess. That's right. Shame on Michael Moore for what he's done to America, because he's the divider. He's the one with his lies, has worked to divide America, and he's trying to recreate another Vietnam and bring our troops home in shame, and we're not gonna sit idly by and allow that to happen. The world's a much better and a much safer place now that Saddam is gone and Osama is ousted from power. <laughs> <laughs> if you look at the guy, it, you're not thinking like, oh, you know, I can't approach him, he's unapproachable, and he just seems like someone you can talk to, and I don't know, it's nice. Michael is surrounded by tight security on the tour. He often refers to them as his fitness trainers. This is a private meet and greet. We're not allowed this part to be videoed. We're not allowing this part to be videoed. This is a private meet and greet. Okay. This is not for press. It isn't? No, not this part. Thank you. Shouldn't we be able to believe the President of the United States? I mean, is that too much to ask for? That what comes out of his mouth is the truth? Of course, some people say, well, Clinton lied, right? <laughs> right, exactly. About a blowjob. You know, I mean... <laughs> Wait! Newsflash! 
Let's go to the CNN screen right now and see how many people have died from a blowjob. Why, it's none. My last week of my senior year in high school, uh, two things happened. I was elected class clown um, by my fellow uh, students. And, and I was elected by the people in the community as the first 18-year-old ever elected to the public office in the state to the school board. You become already a national icon for the youth movement. But more importantly, I think, was the platform he had as a member of the school board to raise issues that he would simply get kicked out of class for if he raised them in the classroom suddenly. He was a member of the establishment, and believe me, folks in Davidson, Michigan, did not appreciate Michael Moore. <laughs> they still don't. <laughs> you don't like Dave Barber? Well, too bad. His brother owns the station. You know, you're never a star in your own hometown. And I think Michael has certainly been a victim of that. Why hasn't this community embraced him? I think he's right in being fed up with Flint. I don't blame him. After the show, Dave gives us a tour of the Flint Davison area, showing us some of Michael's old haunts and the ongoing problems with Flint. We're approaching one of the focal points for uh, Michael's Roger and me, downtown Flint, Michigan. There is the city hall to the right, and right across the street, the Genesee County Jail. This is where Buick used to sit. Where the empty lot is? Yep. This was called Buick City. You can get a feel for how far back it went. This building right here used to be Buick headquarters right here. This building is vacant. Most of the people that are living in Flint City proper are people that can't afford to leave. That's particularly troubling. It was also a city that at one time had the highest per capita income of any city in the United States of America. Yeah, you could go in there and punch your time clock each day, but you truly could live the American dream. Well then, General Motors decided they didn't need us anymore and started uh, leaving uh, this community and surrounding communities in record numbers. It was devastating to the people here. I think there was a part of Mike that was, uh, you know, heavily invested in the factories of Flint because uh, he had a lot of ancestors that worked there like I did. And though he didn't work there, he always showed a keen interest in what was going on there. We're driving up upon the building right now where it all started. This was where uh, Michael had the Flint voice. As I recall, Michael may have also lived here. You know, it kind of was his office and apartment all kind of in one building. After high school, Michael publishes an alternative paper for 10 years called The Flint Voice. It's a rabble-rousing newspaper challenging political authority. It started out uh, in just in Flint as a monthly, and then it went bi-weekly, and then we went statewide, a circulation of around 10,000. Dave Marsh, a music critic, writes a syndicated column that Michael runs in the Flint Voice. I've been doing, since 1982, a newsletter called Rock and Roll Confidential. And yeah, he, he wanted to use news items from, from my newsletter because we were writing about a lot of political stuff regarding music that nobody else was covering. The deal was that, you know, he would pay us $10 a month if he used stuff, which he always used, and he never paid. The Flint Voice wasn't the only place that ever ran syndicated material from Rock and Roll Confidential. It is the only one that ever burned us. And it is certainly the only one who was who didn't pay us and basically treated us like we were the ones who were being unfair about it. That was the thing that really frosted my ass. In 1986, Michael leaves the Michigan Voice and moves to San Francisco to become editor of the left-wing magazine, Mother Jones. 
I intend to, I think, get back to the old days of muckraking journalism here to return Mother Jones to its hell-raising roots. After only five months, he's fired. The people at Mother Jones want to forget the entire episode and all the bad publicity they got from dumping Michael. It's a particular sore spot in its history, the left eating its own. I was surprised that 20 years later, people were still this upset about Michael Moore. People that I knew there that I had hired and worked with for years were telling me the guy was just impossible, and they were demoralized. There was a meeting of the staff, and Deirdre English, whose place he was taking, was there, and he kind of basically trashed the magazine in no uncertain terms. The whole Mother Jones episode in Michael Moore's career is quite an interesting one, and one that he has portrayed very successfully, that he was simply too honest and too real for the effete intellectual liberals at Mother Jones. There's a big cultural chasm that has long been a part of left politics in America. This cultural clash became quickly intolerable, particularly to the management of Mother Jones. And it expressed itself in ways that did concern debates over editorial content. After Michael is fired, he sues Mother Jones for $2 million and wages a national PR campaign against the magazine and the press. On August 5th, I was ordered by Adam Hochschild, chairman of the board of the foundation that owns Mother Jones, to publish an article on Nicaragua that said, in essence, that the Sandinistas are a group of Leninists. I obviously didn't get along with the owner, Mr. Hochschild, uh, because of our disagreement on this particular article in Nicaragua. It was an outrageous article that, that, that echoed many of the things that Ronald Reagan says about the Sandinistas. There were leftists at the time who were appalled at the Reagan administration's policy toward Nicaragua, but who also had no illusions about the Sandinistas, who certainly were not perfect social democrats. Some people might say that you can disagree with Reagan and also disagree with the Sandinistas. I guess that was too complicated for him. It had to be political, it had to be working class, it had to be about Nicaragua, it had to be about all these things. And of course that's what gets buzz. And the political world wanted to see, you know, this terrible political uh, sin that had been committed against Michael Moore, when in fact it was much more an accumulation of smaller things. There was a budget of millions of dollars, there was a very specific schedule, and Michael wasn't used to that, or maybe perhaps not ready for that. For the first time in his life, Guy Saperstein, a well-known civil rights lawyer, crosses the aisle to defend Goliath, in this case, Mother Jones. The picture emerged um, very consistently that um, Michael was very non-collaborative, very insecure, very suspicious. He wasn't doing a good job of explaining the many confrontations he had with employees. It was more important for him to be quick and witty than to be thoughtful. Michael leaves San Francisco with a settlement of $58,000, only $8,000 more than he was offered initially. Jim Musselman is working for consumer advocate Ralph Nader when he gets the despondent call from his friend Michael. I was in Washington, D.C., and Michael was very depressed because he had just been fired and he didn't know what he was going to do. That's when I basically talked to Ralph that night, and I said, Ralph, you've got to give Michael a job. He said, usually, you know, I don't hire too many people. And, and I said, Ralph, I vouch for him, hire him. And Ralph said to me, okay, I'll do it. As it turned out, it was just the greatest thing on earth, you know, that they canned him and, you know, he got a little money out of the deal because obviously paved the road for what uh, became his stock and trade. The EMU is illegally using Tampa's money to bring Michael Moore here. It's wrong. It's unethical. You mean like how many billions spent in Iraq for a war that had nothing to do with what's happening? Yes. We're still following Michael on his slacker tour through Michigan, but he decides not to do a press conference at Central Michigan University, which means we won't be able to ask him any questions. Yeah, I uh, was working hard last night to put up signs for this protest tonight. I'm sorry, rally, pro-Bush rally, not a protest. Um, and by 10 o'clock this morning, I heard that most of them were down. I have to do a lot of outside of campus, out on campus stuff for class. And I came to this one because one of the categories for the things is engaged in civic duty or something like that. And he's very contradictory. Uh, contra 
contradictory and everything, and there's a lot of controversies for him and stuff. So. Oh, what do you think of Michael Moore? I really don't know much about him. I didn't know who he was until this year, so it's a learning experience for me. I realize after following Michael to a few of his slacker speeches, I agree with one of his favorite mantras. The question I have for our media is, where were you before the war? Why didn't you ask the hard questions? Why didn't you demand the evidence? If you look at the coverage of the Iraq War, there is criticism. But look what it is. I mean, the criticism is it's not going well. I mean, if you read Pravda, Pravda in the early 80s, uh, when Russia was invading Afghanistan, it would have looked very much like the liberal press in the United States. You should not be getting your news from a guy with a high school education in a central Michigan ball cap. This is not how you should be hearing this. Where is our media? Where is our media? Do your job. Do your job. Come on. On the other hand, his ramped up stage style on yelling reminds me of an old time preacher. His audiences holler amen to every sermon. He even uses a tactic he loves to criticize George Bush for, fear. George W. Bush it has run out of troops. There is no way he can continue even this war without bringing back the draft, and that's exactly what he's going to do if he gets another four years. You're going to be called up. You're going to be called up. You're going to have to go and fight George Bush's wars. Michael Moore and the whole Bush machine are both master manipulators. They're both committed to a starkly ideological view of reality, and, and they're both very good at screening out anything that doesn't confirm that view. Back in 1986, Michael helps filmmaker Kevin Rafferty with his film on white supremacists. White power! So you're actually responsible for putting Michael Moore, the first one to put Michael Moore on film. I think so. You know, they, they don't even want to learn our language. Michael is interviewing a beautiful blonde woman in an SS uniform. Now, you don't look like a typical Nazi, you know? I mean, you know, the ones we're used to seeing in the movies and on uh, TV. Oh. <laughs> uh, you know, I mean, you could be in a, a Coppertone commercial. For... I'm not just, no, I'm not just against Jewish people. It's also black. But that was, I think, the first time Michael saw himself being funny on film, and I don't know. It, could have had some influence on his future stuff. In return for helping out on Blood in the Face, Rafferty shoots part of Michael's groundbreaking film about Flint and gives him some advice. I told him, you know, look, you don't want to put yourself in your own movie. You know? <laughs> if he'd have taken my advice, he'd, he'd be in an office like this now, still looking for $5,000 grants. Uh, I told him not to use narration. He does go around saying I saved him $40,000 because he didn't have to go to film school, so. He did put himself in his movies, and it's wonderful, the result. I mean, he's become a much-needed voice on the left. Whether or not you agree with every point he makes is another question. The one undeniable thing about his movies is that they have been a huge success. He's a worldwide celebrity. It's called Roger and Me. Roger is Roger Smith, chairman of General Motors, and Me is the filmmaker, Michael Moore who spends much of the film trying to see Roger Smith. The plot is Moore's unsuccessful quest for answers from Roger Smith. It was a documentary about my hometown of Flint, Michigan and what uh, General Motors did to the town. And so I go on this quest in the movie to find Roger Smith to see if he would come to Flint. Well, Toronto's answer to the Cannes Film Festival is now in full swing. The 14th annual Festival of Festivals is a 10-day movie marathon featuring 322 films from 38 countries. Back in 1989, we didn't know who Michael Moore was. Loved the movie, Roger and Me. We absolutely loved it, so it was kind of a rave fave inside the festival, which absolutely became a rave fave outside the festival. So we were all dying to meet this Michael Moore. Well, I, I'm kind of, I'm, uh, I kind of, I actually, I don't like documentaries, and 
And in comes this guy who looks like a truck driver with a beer belly and the hat. And you go, I don't get it. How did this happen? I, I can't stand to watch PBS. Um, <laughs> <clears throat> and I, you know, all these. When I first started, all these people told me about you know getting grants from PBS and all that. And I just thought, well, that would just that would kill me right there. I rate Roger me uh, absolutely the best, and that's for two reasons. I I'm, have a very soft spot for first films. That's that's me. My mission was a simple one: to convince Roger Smith to spend a day with me in Flint. But I also have a really strong feeling about movies that have a enormous impact on what other filmmakers do from that moment forward. I wanted to show the destruction of the city uh, and how General Motors closed down the factories, why they did it, but do it in a way that was humorous and you know, appealed to people on, on a, a level other than just a, you know, a very serious uh, film. At that point, the film was such a hit that all of the buyers were jumping all over each other to get his name on the contract. And he kept on with the, you know, the hayseed popping out of the teeth act and the truck driver kind of appearance. And we thought, well, wait a minute. Uh, who's the smarter one here? Because he's now jacked the price up, you know, to three, four, or five times the asking price. The progression, you know, from 50,000 to 100,000 to a million and a half to three, it kind of made sense. But only when you look at it as a whole. You couldn't really say at any one moment early on, yeah, we're going to get to three million. This was uh, that magic moment that happens in film then. He had been discovered. So his, uh, everything uh, was on the table for him. The stakes were very, very high. With the success of Roger and Me comes a critical rap that Michael is taking liberties with the truth and the chronology of events for greater dramatic effect. He's been found to have fabricated or invented, or carpentered uh, a number of distortions and um, outright lies into his narrative. No, stay with, stay with him. Turn out. In Flint, the local university theater troupe is rehearsing its play about Michael Moore. I'm sorry, guys. We seem to have lost the video feed. Let's continue live from the studio. While researching the script, the director discovers several startling fabrications in the film Roger and Me. Turn it up all he talks about uh, um, a town hall meeting that's supposed to take place in Flint, in downtown Flint, where um, Ted Koppel and Nightline are going to come and cover this Biggest town hall meeting. Come when Ted Koppel announced he would interview city officials live in front of City Hall on Nightline. And then he goes on to show a news report where a reporter explains that that broadcast with Ted Koppel is not going to happen because the broadcast truck has been stolen by an unemployed auto worker. Apparently, though, just moments before the broadcast, someone got in the satellite truck and drove it off, cables and all. So now Nightline has had to cancel their segment from the city of Flint, and police are looking for a suspect. And the fact is that, that that's all actually completely fictional. He made up the news broadcast. He made up the theft. It never happened. He made up the actual town hall meeting. There's covenant, I do believe, between a filmmaker who calls himself a nonfiction documentary filmmaker and the audience that what you're putting on the screen, what you're saying is a fact, is a fact. And that includes the time sequences and everything else because that's the audience relaxes and says, okay, I'm gonna accept what this man is telling me. I mean, I like his point of view. And in that case, um, he didn't do that. He'd broken that covenant several times. He broke the taboo on people going to see a documentary in a theater. He made it sexy again. So the debate on what he has done to the documentary doesn't really interest me. What interests me is what he did for that form, getting it to the people, the masses, into the mainstream, and getting um, it taken seriously by the distributors. Leave the real world behind and step into the largest indoor family entertainment center in the world. To encourage tourism during its economic decline, the city of Flint builds an auto theme park, a hotel, and a new shopping mall. But Michael makes it seem like this all occurred after GM laid off 30,000 workers. Anyone watching Roger and me would come away from that film thinking that 
One night, Dan Rather gets on the news and says the entire town of Flint has been fired. And subsequent to this economic catastrophe that happened, Flint set into motion three public projects to cauterize what had been an economic hole that had been blown through the community. That's not the way any of it happens, as it turns out. They had been developed, built, and failed of their own accord before there had been any kind of firing. Chronology issues aside, which I just can't really take seriously, I think it's, a, I think it's an enormously honest film. Because if you just spent half an hour in Flint, Michigan, you just really wouldn't debate whether there was a direct correlation between plants closing and 30,000 jobs going away and the complete decrepitude, that's a word, of the town. In an interview for his magazine, Harlan Jacobson confronts Michael about the manipulation of time in Roger and Me. Did he answer the questions when he asked about the chronicity? I mean, did he say, well, this is why I did this, or quite frankly, you're right, but it makes for better movie making or to... Never. It just simply veered off into some strange, eerie Twilight Zone form of paranoia. The conversation took a completely different, crazy train of thought. He accused me of working for Roger Smith, uh, the then chairman of General Motors, that I worked for Lincoln Center. Lincoln Center was in bed with GM. It became a highly paranoid display rather than a conversation of documentarian and a journalist critic. Shortly after the article appears in film comment, Harlan Jacobson is fired. In the years before Michael finished Roger and Me, Flint, Michigan had been held hostage by General Motors. The company threatened to pack up and leave if their property taxes weren't slashed. Jim Musselman and his boss, Ralph Nader, were big critics of GM's demands. Nader had already fought the big three car companies on many issues, particularly auto safety. We had started this whole campaign of bringing Roger Smith to the communities where they were asking for these huge tax abatements. What was amazing to me, the most incredible thing, was it was a coalition of working class people trying to get Roger Smith to address what was going on in their communities. Uh, we're dealing with all kinds of issues that were related to job loss, and we were sounding an alarm for that. At this grassroots meeting, Mike Westfall and Jim Musselman invite Michael Moore to speak. This is very, very significant that all of these people, Teamsters, UAW members, teachers, black groups, women's groups, peace groups, have all come together for the first time. This is a very significant event. We had a public meeting in Flint, Michigan, where 500 people showed up and wanted to fight against General Motors and did organizing, did petitions, did everything. We had people with bullhorns for Roger Smith protesting outside the GM building. And Michael had all this film, and I was like, this is great, you know, this is, this is incredible. But at that time, the movie was called Dance Band on the Titanic. While editing the film, Michael shows his friend Jim Musselman a rough cut. He's surprised to learn the focus of the movie is Michael's quest to talk to GM chairman Roger Smith. He sat there and told me that everything dealing with the citizens' movement, everything dealing with the workers, the union people, that was always on the cutting room floor. I, I sat there and I was like, what happened? All of a sudden, the whole movement changed into Michael. Months later, while promoting his film, Michael forgets about his allies in his struggle against GM. You got a lot of help from, among others, Mike Westfall, a proud UAW uh, member, Jim Musselman, an attorney. He made it look like he came out of nowhere, and, and, and this was his vision, and, and it wasn't. Well, that's not true. Oh, that's they a lie. Drew, they worked hard. Oh. On, they fought General Motors no. back. Please no, no. let me finish, Mike. Yeah. You, you, you do get to speak. I don't know who these other people are. These other people you mentioned, uh, the people from, the attorneys from Nader's office uh, hand-delivered a statement to you earlier today uh, stating that these people are off on a limb. For the longest time, I struggled with it because it was, it was like I, I felt like Michael was, first of all, somebody I could trust, but somebody who was a friend. At one point, Michael actually was saying that Ralph should retire, that Michael was the new Ralph, and that Ralph can go off to pasture. And that's when I was like, I felt like it was Dr. Frankenstein creating this monster. Ralph trusted him, we all trusted him, and then all of a sudden, it was like, who is this guy? 
And I'll never forget the phone call after Michael's movie came out. And I said to these people, I said, how about going to the annual meeting next year with Roger Smith and, and bringing up this? I said, just let Michael Moore go. He's, he's the great savior. You purport to be a, a supporter of Flint, and yet uh, you made a mockery in the film of a couple of fundraisers that put more than $75,000 back into this community. What are you going to put back into this community? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm sorry I made a movie that millions of Americans want to see. <laughs> I thought Fahrenheit 9-11 was very insightful. I thought it was an excellent social criticism that was needed at the time. We are all Americans, however, we need to be critical of our government to make them do a better job. I think that he's really good at what he does. I hear from people that he's, you know, sort of twists people's words and, and stuff, but I think that his films are important, and um, I feel that they bring up a lot of interesting points of view. Michael's security harassed my cameraman and refused to let him plug into the soundboard to get clear audio, despite the fact other cameramen are doing the same thing. I'm starting to think Michael Moore doesn't want us to make this film. I thought he liked Canadians. And if you continue to bother us, we're going to be asked to leave. That's what I'm being told. Well, all I know is you let these other people in, so I just Okay, I, I, don't, I don't have the answer to that. I don't like, the only thing I have the answer to is you saying no. I don't know why or anything like that. And that's my final answer. I'm also being told if you continue to bother and harass us about it, we're going to be asked to leave. That's okay. harassment now. Okay. I was just asking. Yeah. Right? Okay. We have a few of our Republican brothers and sisters who've joined us today. No, 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 no. no, no. Let's show them, let's show them we're not like them. We actually welcome opposing viewpoints at our rallies. It's not... You go to a George Bush rally, you gotta sign a loyalty oath to get in there. It's a party run by angry white guys. And if you turn on any of their right-wing talk shows or O'Reilly or Scarborough or any of those things on TV and they're angry all the time, right? They shout, they're, ah, ah, shut up! No, you shut up! Shut up! We'll be right back. Shut up! It's, uh, and, and, you know, the reason they're so angry is because they know their time is up. I was absolutely disappointed. I was hoping to actually hear a platform from the other side. Though I am a Republican, I am an open-minded Republican, all today I heard was bandwagon approach and slander. I don't like hearing slander from either side, but this was an absolute insult to my integrity today. Have you seen Fahrenheit 9-11? I have not seen Fahrenheit 9-11. I'm a very sensitive person. I cried seeing Saving Private Ryan. I think Michael Moore was eloquent, articulate, and empowering to the student body here at Wayne State. After the success of Roger and Me, people clamor to work with Michael. In 1994, he develops a satirical TV show called TV Nation. For the next eight weeks here, we're going to be bringing you the kinds of stories you won't see anyplace else on TV. So stick with us tonight here on our first night of TV Nation. It's TV Nation with Michael Moore. He put me in a position to be able to do stuff that was smart and funny and edgy and provocative and fun to execute. He let me do stuff that nobody else <laughs> ever let me do. Good start, good start. We did a whole like impeachment piece where we went to Washington two days after they formally decided that they were gonna try and impeach Clinton. Judge Starr, I think I found a cheaper way to conduct a witch hunt. Duel of Satan, look at what thou hast done. We hired a bunch of extras who made all these Puritan costumes like out of the Crucible and just raised hell. <laughs> Your wish hunt cost $40 million. Mine only cost $560. We nailed something right, which was, it was a witch hunt. And we made the really obvious equation, which is, well, let's all dress up as Puritans and go act like we're having a witch hunt. And people responded to it.
had quite enough of your antics and I would like you all to leave. We're just conducting a witch hunt. Yes, that's apparent. Yeah. Look, I'm a lefty. And I always wanted to be an active, not bitter lefty. And so working for Michael gives you a chance to sort of go, you know what? Fuck me. No, fuck you. It was one of those jobs where you worked really hard, and at the end of the day, you were really proud, not that you just made a good TV show, but that you made something that could potentially influence people and make the world a better place. Eventually, I became this person called Crackers, the corporate crime-fighting chicken. I would give a speech when I went into cities, like, greetings, citizens. I hope you're being paid a decently hourly, hourly wage in accordance with all state and federal labor laws. How is your health insurance? And then I just go on and go, so much corporate crime, so little time. The management style, it was very sort of passive aggressive. It was like, it was never like in a traditional entertainment job in LA or New York, people just yell and call you names. There it was very, it was very much more, oh, you're not, you're not staying with the rest of us. You know, <laughs> you wouldn't, you wouldn't necessarily get balled out, but you just wouldn't get invited to certain meetings. Many people, especially those who had worked closely with him, felt that his ego was massively out of control and also speculated that it was overcompensation for, on the part of someone who was at bottom deeply insecure. My experience with Michael was great. I love him. And so, I mean, you always hear stories, but it was Michael's show. It was his ass on the line. So he got to have his own way. The first day I started working there, I just moved from Canada. But my film was opening in Vancouver. And I said, could I take Friday off so I could go and see my film open in Vancouver? And then the next day I came into work, and there were two round trip tickets sitting on my desk and a note from him and his wife, Kathleen, saying, like, what are you, nuts? Go to your film open in Vancouver. Good luck. You know, get out of here. He turns it on, and it's just, it's magic. And then it just, like, he goes into, like, the low mode. And you don't want to be around him when he's in that low mode. You know, and then he comes back, and he's, like, happy, smart, funny guy again. I definitely do remember a lot of times where he was in the Four Seasons, and we were in the dumps on the other side of town. And I just wish that at times he would have stayed in the dumps with us. But he would justify it. He's like, yeah, I'm a Midwest guy. What, what do Midwest people want to do? They want to get rich. So I'm like, all right. I'll hand in that piece on fat cats on the way home to my apartment on the Lower East Side, stepping over junkies, while you go up to your swanky condo. Back on tour, Michael is urging the slackers to get off their butts and vote in the 2004 election. Well, here's what we're doing all across the country. If you're a non-voter, Tonight, I'm going to give you some prizes for committing to vote in front of these people here. And your choices are tonight, the sustenance of all slackers, ramen noodles, ramen noodles, ramen noodles, or clean underwear, clean underwear. Michael believes if more young people had voted in the 2000 election, there would have been a different result. I have decided to contest this inaccurate and incomplete count in order to ensure the greatest possible credibility for the outcome. Ballots are recounted and both sides challenge the procedures in court while the voters take to the streets. When we read about election fraud in other countries, we accept it unconditionally. Oh, really? In Zimbabwe? Oh, really? In Uzbekistan? Oh, really? In Tajikistan? Really? There was voter fraud? Oh, yeah. Yeah, there was some in America, too. That's crazy. You're crazy. I do think that there's been a polarization uh, that's, been, uh, that's been growing. You have no answer. I don't know that that's totally unhealthy. A passion and a passionate discussion of issues I don't think is bad for democracy. You stole it. We're trying to get it. Uh, I'm really happy that the, the whole thing has uh, sort of blown up in this country's uh, face. Uh, so many things have come up that I think people were never aware of, starting with just the fact that their vote doesn't count. A great deal of Michael Moore's popularity comes from the fact that there simply isn't anyone on the left saying outrageous and unfair things about the right. Because the right so much dominates the media, the Ann Coulters, the Bill O'Reilly's, the Sean Hannity's, who really make very shallow, very aggressive arguments. We expect every American to support our military, and if they can't do that, to shut up. After 35 days of protests and confusion, the Supreme Court rules in a straight party vote not to have further recounts, giving George Bush the presidency. 
I think we all know that Bush is not legitimate. I think Republicans know it too. And this has been a cancer eating at American politics ever since. There are people who are primed to see this as us against them. And if the religious fundamentalists and the Bush administration are them, then I guess Michael Moore is us. In the campaign leading up to the 2000 election, Michael Moore backs Ralph Nader, the Green Party candidate. So he throws himself into the 2000 presidential election. He, and he calls Bush and Gore Tweedledee and Tweedledum. Last week, in what they called a debate, summed it all up for me. Welcome, Governor Bush, and welcome, Vice President Bush, uh, I mean, Gore. That pretty much summed it up for me right there, folks. They're the same damn person. No matter how else you feel about the Supreme Court decision or anything else, okay, the Nader vote in Florida lost Gore the election. Okay, it's really that simple. What's your take on being pegged the spoiler in 2000? That's an arrogant manifestation of the Democrats thinking that they, they own their voters. It's very anti-democratic, of course. Michael abandons his friend Ralph Nader and his hope for a third party in America. Ralph decided to go and campaign in the swing states. And so a lot of us got off his bus at that, at that point because we weren't going to do that. You know, when he said he, he asked Nader to pull out of the race, that was all BS. I was working on the campaign. He was sitting there in the super rallies up until the last week. He finds a hundred different ways to disown it, but that's what he did, and guess what? It was great for him. <laughs> and here's why. If Gore is in the White House, fundamentally, Michael Moore has no career. In 2002, Michael Moore's film Bowling for Columbine catapults him to stardom. His Oscar-winning film takes on America's love affair with guns. It grosses 58 million worldwide, making Michael Moore the cultural icon of the left. On a certain level, Bowling for Columbine is also all about being the opposition to this guy who's in the White House, this right-wing Republican guy who's in the White House who likes guns. I started the film with the attitude that the solution to our problem is that we needed more gun control laws. When we went to Canada, I became very uncomfortable with that position because there's seven million guns that are owned by private citizens in Canada. The guns that Canadians have are longbore single-shot hunting rifles, and virtually no one is killed in this country by longbore single-shot hunting rifles. You can't take them into the 7-Eleven with you inconspicuously. The guns that kill people are handguns. And handguns are very strictly controlled in Canada. Gun control is just such a, a, a crushingly obvious solution to the problems that America faces. Furthermore, it's the solution which has been adopted uniformly throughout the industrialized world, you know, Europe, Asia, Canada. So obviously I thought that was the direction he was going. And yet at some point the movie takes this bizarre little turn where he says, oh, it can't be just about gun laws because, oh, look at Canada, they've got tons of guns. So it has to be about, what? the entire history of the United States dating back to slavery. So for him, American society is a big wasteland of racism and exploitation, corruption and greed, a truly dysfunctional society. So how do we fix the problem? On the one hand, we have a simple legislative solution, take away people's guns. What Moore winds up plumping in favor of is this sort of cultural transformation of American society. The thought that somehow if Americans overcame their vestigial fear of African Americans, that somehow gun violence would decline, or that a cultural transformation could lead to a decline in gun violence, strikes me as being a deeply implausible view of things. And it, it ascribes far too much power to the culture. From my cold, dead hands. At one point, Michael blames former National Rifle Association President Charlton Heston for contributing to America's gun violence. You can't defend Charlton Heston from my cold, dead hands. At the same time, going into his house, as he did in Bowling for Columbine, wheedling his way in. Uh, we're making a documentary 
about um, uh, you know the whole gun issue, and I'm a member of the NRA. And then to have the man, you know, start calling him uh, names in the middle of the interview, accusing him of doing something which he had not done, which was to go to Flint three weeks after the death of the six-year-old girl and uh, give a speech for the NRA. He did not do that. He, he was not in Flint again for months and showed up there as part of a three-state Republican get out the boat rally. But that footage conveniently fit in to the film at that point to make a different point. And that's just dishonest. Did you feel it was being at all insensitive to the fact that this community had just gone through the Actually, shooting? I wasn't aware of that at the time we came. We came and did an early morning uh, uh, rally and went on to wherever we were going. You didn't know at the time when you were there that this, no. this killing had happened. Had you known, would you have not Would come? I have canceled the... Uh, yeah. I don't... It's... What he does in the end with Charlton Heston, it's not sad, it's mean. It's just, it just the guy was losing his mind at that point. It just, it just doesn't really make any sense. This is her. Mr. Head, please don't leave. Mr. Heston, please, take a look at her. This is the girl. When Michael Moore attacks the American right to bear arms, he helps to kickstart a new cottage industry, books, websites, and documentaries dedicated to attacking Michael Moore. He was an easy person for the right wing to attack. There's so much silly stuff, so many factual inaccuracies, so many bizarre conspiracy theories in Michael Moore's work. It started because we felt betrayed. We believed in his words, we believed in his work. And then he came out with the movie Bowling for Columbine. And we found out that much of it was invented. Our goal is not, okay, there's a small amount of animosity towards Mike himself. Cause he, he just, after investigating him, you find out he's just not a good guy. Michael Wilson's film, Michael Moore Hates America, is causing a stir in the conservative media. Wilson talks to the people on the bank who gave Michael Moore a gun in Bowling for Columbine. Michael Moore just showed up at your bank one day and, and opened an account and got a gun that you happen to have hanging out in the vault. No, that's not exactly the way the story went. I was contacted by a gentleman in the Traverse area and said that he was doing a story on unique businesses across America. I told him that you would have to come in, we would have to do a background check on you, then we would send your gun to a licensed firearm dealer. And he was very adamant about getting the gun that day. He said to them, if you want to be a part of this film and sort of get this publicity for your, you know, for your bank and things like that, we really need to be able to show on film that you get the you do get the gun. And they said, well, you know, we can I guess we could have it shipped out here. They spent 30 days setting this up ahead of time having meetings with the bank president and the people that were going to be involved and laying out how they wanted it to go. He came over and he did the filming and he was with us probably an hour and a half, I would say. He staged it where he went up and said, I want to open an account. He said, well, how many guns do you have in your vault? And I said, well, I think we carry around 500 guns at any given time in our vault. 500 of these you have in your vault? In our vault. Wow. 300 miles away. And he was told that. Okay, thank you very much, wow. He probably wanted people to believe that any one of the tellers in any of the 26 branches at that time could just go back and get you a gun. If I'm gonna commit a crime, I'm not gonna spend five grand to do it. I'm not gonna leave all of my information with the bank and the FBI <laughs> and then go, oh, by the way, you know that gun that has the serial number on it that you gave me for free? Yeah, I'm gonna use this one. In many ways, we'd like to thank Michael Moore because he really spurred a lot of conservatives to do something and get back into filmmaking because they realized, you know, we can't let the popular culture just belong totally to one side. And it's the one thing the Republicans can't figure out how to do. It drives them crazy. They don't know how to make movies. I do thank him because he spawned an industry. We have a, a whole slew of great documentaries uh, that answer him. The industry is laughably bad, so I don't think that those films mean crap. Whether you agree with us or not, it's a positive thing because we are adding to speech. We are, we're giving a voice to people that feel like they don't have a voice. They don't seem to be very peaceful. We believe in putting art back above politics and to free conservatives up creatively to just go out and make films that are true to their opinions. They love peace and killing Jews. That's what they're all oh. about. 
A lot of the films in our festival were a direct result of Mr. Moore's polemicized filmmaking, and in a funny way, he, he's probably having an effect that he, he didn't fully intend. <laughs> After deserting Ralph Nader in the 2000 election, Michael takes pot shots at him on the Slacker tour, hoping to woo some of Nader's fans to the Democrats. But they're just angry at his betrayal. Hey, uh, do you party with Nader? All right, all right, we got the Nader people here now. We got the Naders. <laughs> he wanted so badly to get Bush out that he was going to go for the only likely alternative, which was John Kerry. But he didn't have to be so antagonistic to us. He didn't have to go around the country undermining us. It feels good to vote for Ralph. I voted for Ralph. He has that personality quirk. It's not very, uh, it's not very pretty. You go in the voting booth and you close the little curtain, and there you are, just you and Ralph alone in the booth. Oh, there he is on the ballot. Oh, Ralph. Oh, Ralph. Oh, you're so good. You're so right. Ah. Oh. oh. And then you open the little curtain and have a cigarette. And it feels good. It feels good. He's a total sellout. He used to be with Nader, and now he supports Kerry. Kerry's pro war. Total sellout. Can you give me a reason? Nope. Why not? Why not? Touch me. Can you give me a reason? Fascist. Michael Moore's a traitor. Thank you. Nader has asked him to debate. Michael Moore's a chicken shit. Personality, uh, wanting to be loved worrying about his Democratic peers in Hollywood and New York. All this is in the mix with uh, Michael, and I think he's confused. Four months before starting the Slacker tour, Michael launches a weapon from the Cannes Film Festival to unseat President George Bush, Fahrenheit 9-11. We're on our way to Cannes, but before we leave, we get some bad news. So it looks like we're not getting Michael Moore. Michael Moore's being difficult. I was talking to this PR person, and she's like, well, he's only doing minimum amount of interviews, and I don't know if we can accommodate you. This is the guy who wants the entire world to be able to open their doors to him, and he's not opening his doors to anyone when it comes to doing interviews with him. Michael's publicity machine goes into overdrive. He holds court with Peter Bart, editor of Variety. Michael is pissed off Disney has dropped the distribution of Fahrenheit 9-11. The potential of this film to have an impact on the election is much larger than they thought. And that is more scary and perhaps worse for their personal pocketbooks if our side wins. But Disney says they told Miramax a whole year earlier that they were not to distribute Fahrenheit 9-11. Every person in the world, with the exception of Taiwan and Hong Kong, those are the only two places we don't have a distributor, everybody else in the world can see this movie but Americans. At one level, Michael Moore clearly knew that he was manipulating the marketing situation by claiming censorship. But I'm sure that no matter how consciously he was aware of that, he also fully believed in his own injury, fully believed that he had been wronged. Palm d'Or this year at the Cannes Film Festival to Fahrenheit 9-11. He got that enormous ovation and part of it was for the film and part of it was because people really opposed Bush. And the first thing that Tarantino said to me on the stage there was, I want you to know I am not a political person. This was not given to you for the politics in the film. It was given to you because this was the best movie we saw this year. Gilles Jacob, who runs the festival, said that it was an absolutely pure political move. I think I would take his word over Tarantino's. Right. 
Got it. Ten days Whatever. after Cannes, Michael strikes a distribution deal with Lionsgate Films, IFC Films, and the Weinstein Brothers' newly formed company. Miramax had a history of going to Lionsgate to help them distribute controversial films Disney didn't want to touch. No. In fact, everyone came out very well out of it. Disney was able to recycle the profits in such a way that no one could accuse them of colluding with more, but you know, they didn't do badly. And now they did more, and, and now they did the white starts. Everyone wins, except for those who really care about honest political debate. <laughs> The world embraces Fahrenheit 9-11. Its phenomenal success is unparalleled in the documentary film world. It grosses over $220 million and is the first American film to publicly denounce George Bush and his war in Iraq. It starts a debate that ripples through America. Michael hopes it'll be the stake needed to drive George Bush from office. Fahrenheit 9-11 has been great to get some discourse going, which is certainly the most you can hope for with a film, is that it throws some ideas out there and challenges some perspective. I don't know what's going to happen with the election. I hope that this documentary affects the election because this documentary is telling the truth regarding a lot of issues where the truth has been suppressed for the last three years. Here's a guy who's speaking his mind, and a lot of people agree with him. I basically agree with him myself. I don't always agree with his methods, but his political point of view is something that every man on the street here basically agrees with. The fact that Michael Moore's films are very popular is perhaps an indication that American society cares more about entertainment than it cares about politics because they're certainly not politically sophisticated or politically thoughtful. Michael Moore could only have become popular in a vacuum. If there were a vibrant left in the United States, Michael Moore's milk toast radicalism would be laughed at rather than laughed with. Given that he is, I think, a very smart guy, I was surprised at some of the fatuousness of some of the connections that he was making. Charges of manipulation and hyperbole have dogged Michael since Roger and me. He uses the tools of the editor to break the principles of the journalist trade. And in Fahrenheit 9-11, he's up to his old tricks. What do you say to critics who say you manipulate facts in your film to make your point? That's true. Uh, what do you think? <laughs> film is edited. It is manipulated to present a point of view. The facts in the film are 100% completely true. I didn't put the words or the semi-words in Bush's mouth. That's him speaking. That's not me, you know, doing a ventriloquist thing. In Fahrenheit 9-11, Michael uses this speech. This is an impressive crowd, the haves and the have-mores. <laughs> but he fails to mention that Bush is speaking at the Al Smith dinner, a Catholic fundraiser where politicians are supposed to tell jokes and poke fun at themselves. Some people call you the elite. I call you my base. <laughs> it's not fair to use something said in that context to make a point that it was not intended to make even if there's some truth behind that point. And I see Bill Buckley's here tonight, fellow Yale man. Bush comes off as a guy who's capable of self-mockery, which is a very valuable political trait. We go way back and we have a lot in common. And Moore comes off as someone who doesn't fight fair. Bill wrote a book at Yale, I read one. <laughs> I think he abuses people. I, I would ex suspect that many people who have been in his films would only prefer that they had not been. All those soldiers in my movie where I just turned the camera and let them speak to the camera and express their disillusionment and their dissatisfaction with this war. Sergeant Peter Damon is one of several soldiers who would have preferred not to have been in Fahrenheit 9-11. He's a staunch supporter of George Bush and the war in Iraq. Although he sued Moore and lost, he still feels helpless at how he was unwittingly portrayed by Michael Moore. What happened was he, uh, he apparently had found an interview that I had done on um, battlefield pain medication. When I first got back from Iraq, it was right before I was going into surgery. You can plainly see my arms, my stumps, they were kind of just sewn up, there were scars. Like I still feel like I have hands 
and the pain is like my hands are being crushed in a vice. I guess the message would, that Michael Moore was trying to get across was that, you know, the Bush administration is leaving all these. They don't care about the guys that are over there fighting war. They come back and they just leave, leave them behind. He's smart enough to very rarely say anything that is simply provably untrue, but he's very good at the suggestion, the guilt by association, the manipulation of, of an out-of-context image. I happen to agree with Bush's decision to go to, to Iraq. I think it had to be done sooner or later. I mean, I you know joined the military fully realizing the risks that were involved, and uh, joining the military was the best thing I've ever done with my life. Michael Moore shows up at the Democratic convention, where he's greeted like a rock star. The public image of Michael Moore is cemented at this stage. Those that love him, love him. I just want to say thank you very much. You are, you are amazing. Those that hate him, hate him. And I believe he's marginalized himself with the mainstream. Michael's as much on the outside of the Democratic Party as he ever was. I don't think he even met John Kerry during the course of the whole campaign. As a matter of fact, I know he didn't. Democrats traditionally are afraid. They're a scaredy cat party. <laughs> uh, that's why the Republicans win most of the time, because they got courage. And they believe in something, and they stand up for what they believe in. And they say, fuck you. You're damn right we're taking this money away from black people. You're damn right. Fuck them. And Americans go, whoa, those guys stand for something, even though it's the wrong stuff. How do you like yourself on camera? Oh, I hate it. Can't David Gilmour interviewed Michael Moore when he was a film critic for the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation. In his 15 years of doing interviews, David says the one he did with Moore about Canadian bacon is the one everyone remembers. This is Michael's only dramatic film and is one of his rare failures. I suspected, and it turned out to be true, that the second I asked him the first thing he didn't like to hear, the little persona of the sweet little boy, the regular guy, that mask slipped off, and I thought, that's the real Michael Moore. There are people you know who are having real <coughs> serious problems with this movie, Canadian Bacon. I mean, no, people, are, you got a list? Yeah, I got a list. Well, I got a long list. They think it's amateurishly shot. Mm -hmm. Uh, badly directed right and not funny right wow. which is a problem for a comedy well uh, those people like art house films you know right. and I made a film you know for people like me some critics said this is the first left-wing film for the mall crowd <laughs> and I don't know whether he was knocking people who go to shopping malls or you know live in trailer parks or whatever but uh, I consider that a compliment I mean where are you from uh, Toronto yeah, where'd you, and, and uh, where where'd you go to school? Yeah, where'd you go to school? I went to private schools. So, you know, you come from a different class than I come from. Yeah. You know, so, you know, you might like different things than I like. I don't think it's got anything to do with a highbrow intellectual crowd. I think it's possible that maybe you didn't make a good film, mm -hmm. and I think you've got to acknowledge that rather than dismiss the people who don't like you. Well, I don't, as if there's something well, wrong. I don't have to, well, I don't have to acknowledge it. I think I made a very good film, a film that I'm very proud of. He was really quite a schizophrenic interview because I could tell that he wanted me dead. But at the same time, I had him on film. And the only way that he was going to get that off film was to make me like him again. But some people won't love the film. Right. It's OK. You don't, right. you don't have to love the film. Right. OK. You know, I, 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 you know I'll, I'll still talk to you. <laughs> <laughs> Here's a guy who makes his living going around, dropping in on people, putting a camera on them, catching them in awkward positions, and then filming them. All I'm saying is, if you're going to do that for a living, you got to be prepared to have it happen to you. And when it does happen to you, you better behave with some grace. Otherwise, you're going to look like a hypocrite. We're on our way to Kent State University to videotape Michael Moore on another stop in his Slacker Uprising tour. Kent State is hallowed ground in the anti-war and freedom of speech movement, where the shooting of students by National Guards in 1970 helped turn the tide against the Vietnam War. 
Michael Moore and his people were now demanding everyone attending his press conference show credentials. Although Chum Television commissioned our documentary to air on City TV, we had no business cards. With this setback, we decided to step over the line. We made cards to show at the door so we could get in. A trick we learned from Michael Moore. My friends and I decided to pose as a TV crew from Toledo to sneak inside the factory. You are? Debbie Melnick with City TV. City TV. We get into the press conference and wait for Michael to arrive. Has anyone ever approached Michael Moore on doing a documentary with him? People can do what they want, you know. I mean, if they want to video him and make a documentary about him, I'm sure that's um, up to them. So everybody ready? Okay, so it looks like it's about to happen. He's going to be joined by a special guest, as I mentioned, and um, the two of them are going to be here together. So, and here they are. Hi. Hello. Hi. Thank you for being here. We have a special guest uh, with us here, as you can see. Roseanne is joining me tonight. We are now just a little more than a week away from uh, uh, the big election day, and we're cautiously optimistic. I finally confront Michael about the bad treatment we're getting from his staff, but he seems surprised by our problems. Michael, I just want to say I really love your films, and I think what you're doing getting the kids out to vote is a wonderful thing. I'm a bit disappointed because I've been trying to get an interview with you for the past couple of months. I'm the Canadian that's been trying and left messages with Terry and your lawyer, Mr. Hurwitz and stuff, and haven't gotten any response. And, and also, you know, we tried to plug into the soundboard at Wayne State, and your bodyguard told my cameraman he had to unplug. And, oh, really? You know, can you help out? <laughs> I mean, why? Well, I'm sure after uh, the election, but right yeah. now, no offense, and you know I, I love the Canadians. Yeah, yeah. But uh, every moment of every waking, <laughs> every day I have is spent on trying to convince Americans to get out and vote. And, and I'm, I'm sorry that I haven't, it, that hasn't happened, but, but it's not, you can understand that's not the priority. Right. Do you, do you, do you, do you, I do you understand re that. And you, respect it? I do respect that. Okay. But so, so then perhaps sometime after the election, maybe. Is that a you promise? Because no. we want to do something with someone. No, because you know, I'm going to sleep for six months. <laughs> but I think I already said that. But, you know, when I wake up, I, I'm always, I always love to talk to Canadians. No, no, you don't have to leave. Oh, they're, they're taking their Bush Cheney signs out. On stage, Michael Moore ridicules the Republicans as they leave. Na, 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 hey. Uh, I hadn't even got to the good part. Suddenly, Michael's publicist and security arrive and kick me and my cameraman out. I guess he was more aware of our film than he let on earlier. Ann Moore, Michael's sister, forces our camera to the ground, but it isn't turned off. Who are you with? City TV. She starts to interrogate me. Let me have your uh, credential, your credential and your license. Do you see this sign? Right. Do you have permission to film for commercial purposes? Documentaries aren't considered... Did you see consider... this sign? No, I didn't see the sign. Okay. There is no filming that is allowed here without permission because there's no commercial ventures. We allow people to film who are part of the affiliates or part of free TV but not for commercial purposes such as you want. But news media such as ABC, NBC, CBS, Fox, CNN are a lot more commercial oriented you know, than, than documentaries. I, I want to know who your supervisor is. I'll call right now. Give me her cell phone number. Stop here my camera. Can you just escort these people out of here? We'll keep your ID and we'll mail it back to you. No, you're not going to be keeping my here. ID. Sorry, you're not keeping my ID. That's bullshit. Right. Yes, please film it right now. I want to stop it. Yeah, you need to yeah, turn it off. Okay. So we're being banned. So you need to leave 
We're being banned from a Michael Moore speech. Who is for free speech? Thank you. Let's go. Voters across the country are headed to the polls. We're going to have to spray after this election to get all the attorney smell out of here. We're in Florida where there were many voting problems in the 2000 election. I hope the Lord's way makes a difference. I fear that it will be Kerry, but I hope it will be Bush. I'd like to see Bush win it. Bush, Bush all the way. This is one of the swing states George Bush and John Kerry are battling to win. This is the day that we've all been waiting for, folks. Today is the day, November the 2nd, 2004. Four more years! Four more years! No more stolen elections! No more stolen elections! America, America, God shed his grace on thee. And crumb thy good with brotherhood from sea to shining sea. And George Bush is my Christian brother. He's saved, born again. And that's the only reason I'm here and I'm voting for him. It's about God and America against the Islam world. If Kerry takes hold of this, Satan has a seat in the United States of America. Bam, you got it. There's your Republican voter. Gays are going to marry? Oh my God! The sky will fall. The sun is going down now over uh, Biscayne Bay down here in Miami. And it is, uh, there is something in the air. There is a stillness in the air. There's an excitement. America has spoken, and I'm humbled by the trust and the confidence of my fellow citizens. I don't think you can say that Fahrenheit 9-11 had any sort of electoral effect one way or the other on the campaign. Where it did have an effect was in energizing the base. First, the base of the Democratic Party, and then, in reaction, the base of the Republican Party. And this was an election in which there was record voter turnout. People were very, very fired up, energized, agitated. Fahrenheit 9-11 was one of those things that created that. Fahrenheit 9-11 is fine, but I believe that it fell into a certain category, namely preaching to the choir. It became almost a secular church where people could pray together, worship together, attack the Bush infidel together. It does illustrate, I think, how deeply upset people on that side get about Michael. And let's face it, people who are upset are far more likely to actually bother to vote and to bother to tell their friends to vote. Did he lose the election? No, I'm not making that argument. Did he do no good for his side in the election? I totally don't think he did any good whatsoever for the John Kerry campaign. Michaels wound up selling himself. And from Bowling for Columbine forward, every time something goes really well for Michael Moore on a personal level, on a fame level, and on a bank account level, fundamentally things get worse and worse in the country. Michael's down after he fails to get George Bush out of office. But eight months later, he rises from the ashes to open his new film festival in Traverse City, Michigan. Traverse City is a beautiful resort town about a three-hour drive northwest of Flint. It's known as the cherry capital of America. The town is a white, wealthy, Republican stronghold. Michael lives close by on Torch Lake in a multi-million dollar beachfront house he calls a log cabin. We're not used to being around Republicans, so now 
now that I'm here, which has broadened my horizons. I've met many Republicans on the street, and I've had some wonderful conversations uh, with them. It's opening night at the festival, and the Old State Theater is sold out. Just as the Sundance Film Festival is Robert Redford's legacy, Michael hopes Traverse City will be his. Four months later, we go back to Flint when we hear Michael Moore is getting the Paul Wellstone Memorial Award. A right-wing book has come out stating Moore's non-profit foundation had invested in Halliburton stock, and I wanted to ask him about that. So I still Thank can't you. convince you to do the interview or anything. <laughs> the Canadians are so No, no, no. <laughs> We're persistent. Uh. We're very persistent. We can't, I mean, can I... What do you want now? I said we can't convince you to maybe to do a sit-down interview at some point. Email you. Not now, not while I'm questions. working. But, you know, I'll be done with this film. And then, you know, maybe we could do something. But that would be... I'm a year away from that. It's still this a year point. away. So. Yeah. I asked Michael about the allegation that he owned Halliburton stock. Have you seen the back cover of this book well, you're talking about? that's what I'm talking about. It doesn't about. say anything about a foundation. It makes it look like it's my tax return. Oh, okay. It's photoshopped. Yeah. Look at the book. Oh, it's photoshopped. You don't see anything about any foundation. Oh, there's no foundation. You don't see anything about a foundation. You make it look like it's my tax return. But, you but know, your foundation didn't do it either, right? I do not. No. The, I, I, first of all, which foundation are you talking about? Because I'm on the board of directors of a number of your charities. Your personal charity. I don't have a personal foundation. Okay. So there's another thing that's okay. wrong. Michael is the president of a private foundation called the Center for Alternative Media and Culture. And according to a 2000 tax return, which can easily be found on the Foundation Center's website, they sold a number of stocks, including the pharmaceutical company Eli Lilly, Halliburton, and the defense contractor Honeywell. But why don't it, you it ain't Why? I've got more important things to do than to answer crazy right-wingers. The time is short. Yeah. The people know the truth. You can't fool the people. A little while, yes. Long term, no. And nobody will believe that stuff. And they don't believe it. Between all the stuff we've talked about tonight, you got a good 20 minutes. Okay. All okay. right? Just as I walk away, Michael grabs me for a hug. Canadian hug. Being Canadian, we don't hug at the drop of a hat. I feel awkward, and I also realize how manipulative it is. But I grin like an unabashed fan anyway. Could you be so kind? The Genesee County Progressive Democratic Caucus presents the first annual Paul Wellstone Memorial Award to Michael Moore. And thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Better than an Oscar. A few months later, I receive a low-quality videotape from a private reception that was held before the awards ceremony in Flint. It's awfully frustrating, sad uh, for me to um, come to Flint. It's the first time I've seen Michael look dejected in public. The closest I've seen to Michael having regrets. When we tried to stop the city council from giving tax abatements to general owners, we talked about this, there's a master plan here to leave this town. And nobody would believe it. And I was just looked at like I was just some kook. Um, then eventually, I mean, uh, Roger and me, and I made that movie in the hopes that people here in other towns like Flint would listen. And uh, um, nobody still wanted to listen. If you look at Michael's movie, it looks like the people were apathetic in Flint, Michigan, and they were the furthest thing from apathetic in Flint. The UAW had promised that a massive demonstration would be held on the last day of the factory. Only four workers showed up to protest the plant closing. If Michael had truly captured what was going on in Flint, Michigan, I think other communities across the country would have seen it and said, we can fight back. You show people winning, and then they're going to fight. <laughs> Are there any techniques uh, 
for storytelling should not be used in documentary filmmaking. Well, I think I think you have I think you have the right to employ just about anything you can to, to make a good movie that's entertaining, as long as you're telling the truth. He said, you know, I can tell the media anything if you tell them anything enough, they'll believe it. You were asking for an interview in an audience with Roger, and you were turned down every time? Every time. Uh, we, we wrote, we phoned, we faxed, uh, we tried every means available, but we couldn't uh, get him to respond. In 1990, Premier Magazine discovered that Michael got two interviews with Roger Smith. No one took much notice. We went to the Waldorf Astoria in New York. It wasn't a shareholders meeting, it was just for the people who owned the most shares of General Motors, the corporate investors, Wall Street, and they wanted to show off their new cars and say how great they were and everything. Michael and I got in and got access to Roger Smith. You know, he sat there and answered questions for about 10 or 15 minutes. And it was some great footage because it was, it was Smith answering questions one-on-one -on -one from Michael. The shareholders meeting, which he actually yes. puts in Roger and me, they cut off his mic or something? But and, 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 he actually did talk to Roger Smith. There's, he did talk to Roger Smith, and, and they had a conversation. There was a two-page transcript of questions going back and forth between Michael and Roger. That's what was in Premier Magazine. And Michael and I were sitting together, and I had called for Roger Smith to resign. Mr. Chairman, I suggest on Monday, if there's an announcement about Mr. McDonald resigning, that you join in and resign with him. Michael then, for the movie, gets into an old theater and cuts and pastes it so it makes it look like Michael was cut off. His microphone wasn't cut off. He was not cut off. I have one question. All right, moved and adjourned. Thank you all very much. You've been a great audience. I would tell you that, I'll tell you that, we never cut him off. He never cut him off. No, nope, it's not our style. I talked to Roger Smith about the shareholders meeting. He wasn't that difficult to find. Why didn't you guys respond to his film when it came out and say that didn't happen? Well, I think the best advice we were getting at that time from people was it's just better not to respond to something as bad as that was. Michael called me in the middle of the night and just, just said, basically, can you just say that this doesn't exist? And I said, it exists. There's a transcript of it. I'm, I can't, I'm not going to fall on my sword for you. I said to him, Michael, you, you talked to him twice already. How can you do a movie on something you've done already? He said, well, I can make it look like anything I want. It'll just go on a cutting room floor. And I would get calls from people who were quote unquote pretty high up on the left and they'd say you have to stand up and lie for them. And they'd say the ends justify the means. I said, isn't that what the CIA says? Isn't that, is, isn't that what our military says? It's, it's always the ends justify the means. And you can't live by that, that mentality. If you won't tell the truth because it's bad for the cause, then the cause becomes a fiction, which is exactly what's happened. It's happened with the left in the United States as a whole, and it's happened with Michael Moore. He's quite capable of putting the Mac in Machiavellian. I say that with love, not, not any hate, but he is driven to get things done by any means necessary, and I don't hold that against him. I'll never forget, uh, I was with him shortly after he cut the deal with Warner Brothers. I said, Michael, you know, the most money you've ever made in your life was like $28,000 a year. And he said, yeah, if you ever uh, see me uh, sitting in a hot tub sipping champagne, come beat me with a baseball bat. You're the same Michael Moore that's the one who started doing movies in Flint? Yeah, I am that same person. If I ever stop thinking like that, I'm doomed. And my work will be doomed. I have to stay true to who that person always was and still is. Love Michael Moore, worship him. The culture of celebrity does have something to do with Michael Moore's popularity. And he's very aware of the way that Americans respond to celebrities because he himself has so successfully melded entertainment and politics. It has blurred into one thing for him, and it's really not. America's celebrity driven, and so we create these icons, and then we look to them for answers when so many times they have other agendas which are tied to themselves or tied to other things. Michael! 
If you want true social change in America, it's got to come from the ground up. It's not going to come from celebrities. And it was always about him rather than the movement. Everyone wanted to hold Michael up there as the savior of the left when he wasn't trying to save the left. He was just trying to create an image for himself. And that's the saddest thing, is who we put our faith in. We follow leaders too much. We don't follow what's in our own heart and soul enough. Over a hundred lovely exotic dancers. You will have a great time today at Nathan Jay's, home of the centerfolds. And listen, you can justify it to your spouse by saying, hey, I went there for the dollar lunch. Mr. Boyce, we actually allowed into the Hall of Fame while he sat on the selection committee of the Hall of Fame. But we overlooked that. According to uh, Roger, Roger Moore, when he did the movie, Roger, Roger and me. Roger Smith. No, I'm talking Roger Moore, the, the filmmaker. Michael Moore. Michael Moore. There you go. Michael Moore. Michael Moore and Roger Smith. I get James Bond. I get James Bond and Michael Moore mixed up all the time. Not everyone does. Exactly. <laughs> I have two hats, a Detroit Tigers and a Detroit Red Wings hat. All other hats are either forced on me at events uh, like this or they are sent to me and my wife throws them away. Oh.